I hope you I hope you are having a good morning. Again, it's very exciting to be sharing this opportunity with all of you. Um, I really enjoyed uh, last month the discussion that we had. And based on the uh, questions that I received, I tried to adjust today's talk um, more towards talking about a few uh, technical aspects where I think um, you had most of the questions last time. Um, it's really uh, incredible that I'm giving the talk um, in the future. Uh, I still get amazed that I'm on Thursday and you guys are on Friday. So the world is definitely getting smaller, but friendships are getting stronger. Um, so I'm glad that I'm sharing with you guys uh, a bit of what uh, we do. Please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, otherwise, I think uh, I'll have enough time for questions at the end. Um, the talk about the talk today is going to be about um, stone management and the epidemiology uh, of, of stones. And um, I'll be sharing with you uh, two uh, technically demanding cases that I think are a good way to uh, talk about a few tricks where we can um, improve our, the care of our patients. Um, it, it has been clearly seen that uh, kidney stones affect a huge amount of the population worldwide. Uh, data from the US shows that 9% of the population will suffer from a stone in their lives at least once. Um, it's a very expensive uh, condition uh, to the health system. It usually costs about $10 billion annually um, and exceeding the treatment uh, costs for prostate cancer and urinary tract in women. So it's definitely more expensive to care for stones than to care for more common uh, debilitating cancers. Uh, the coast and pediatric population are, I would say, more complex to estimate but it, it may be possible that it's somewhere around that number. Increasing prevalence has been seen over the years. And interestingly, it's being seen more amongst adolescents and females. Um, it has reached about 75 to 120 uh, cases per 100,000 uh, people. Uh, the most common composition is calcium oxalate, and there is a high recurrence rate, almost 50% in five years and virtually um, almost 100% after 10 years. So once you have had a stone, it's very likely that it will happen again. And I think this is very important to discuss with families. Since I dedicate my practice to pediatric urology, I think it's really important to let families know that this is something that will be a long-term uh, lifelong condition that will require management forever. Hospitalizations have also increased. So we're now admitting patients, treating them in the hospitals. And in, in, in back in uh, the early 70s uh, or 80s, um, we were not admitting patients. And I will discuss a little bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> right now, I think that uh, way we're treating kids with stones have rise and um, definitely uh, for adults as well. So this is just to mention that uh, there is definitely a geographic distribution. And uh, I think weather plays a big role. Um, this is only the US and you can see that the brighter the color, so the more yellow or orange, the higher the prevalence of stones. And this clearly correlates to warmer areas. More recent data has started to show that this uh, regional distribution is slightly going up, um, up into the northern regions. So I, I think the environment plays a big role. Um, and environment not only means temperature, uh, and dehydration, but also uh, the way we are eating. Um, and originally when this was uh, eventually seen, 
it was thought to be due to food ingestion only. But I think the complexity of stone epidemiology, it's more complex. And worldwide, we do see a very similar distribution with more prevalence in warmer regions. There are associated extra renal factors. Um, and interestingly, these patients, if they have developed stones early on in their lives, they have a higher risk for future osteoporosis, increased risk for fractures, just by having had a kidney stone. High blood pressure, almost 42% increased risk compared to general population. Chronic kidney disease, two times higher. In heart disease, up to 48%. And this is very important to highlight because this then tells us that this is the reflection of a metabolic condition that clearly connects with all those um, uh, conditions mentioned above. Once we have a patient with a kidney stone, I think I have had the opportunity to work in different places around the world. And one of the things is there is incredible variability of how we treat patients. And I think it depends on multiple factors. It depends on access to healthcare, access to high complex care teams that are able to perform uh, treatments and access to technology. And when those are limiting factors, I've seen that management varies. And one of the biggest concerns that I always have with stones is not treating them appropriately and on time. And you can see on this graphs that if you take longer than 24 hours, there is already a response from the kidney with reduction of glomerular filtration rate. So even by being blocked for a few hours, you already see changes that may be permanent. And recent data has shown that every time there is a renal colic, the kidney is under stress and it's losing function. So managing kidney stones definitely requires in as an initial management uh, pain control. But I think surgically, and that's where I want to focus the discussion today, I think we cannot treat uh, stones um, and, and divert management for uh, longer periods of time uh, when sometimes technology is not available. So we have to promote early treatment for our patients. As you can remember from my talk a month ago, I have been doing bibliometric analysis of the literature. And this time I did this bibliometric to look at uh, impact index as well as citation counts. And I'm not sure if you do remember uh, what I mentioned about uh, robotic and laparoscopic surgery, that the trends of publications were going up and the interest in that topic was also going up. But in, in, in stone disease in pediatric population, interestingly, the interest and the amount of publications, it's trending down. We are not doing research in this arena in pediatric patients. It's a completely different scenario for adults. But I think this reflects a lack of social and clinical responsibility uh, where we need to focus our attention and improve the patient of our care based on research. And the research that we have available supporting what we do comes from very poor quality evidence case series, case reports, or non-systematic systematic reviews of the literature. So I think this is just to say, this is an area that requires a lot of effort and research. If we look at how we evaluate patients in the ER once they are presenting with pain, I think one of the most important things to highlight is that we have no good way to assess whether or not there is loss of kidney function or if there is impaired kidney function. And this graph shows clearly how the creatinine, it's a poor marker to show kidney function. The GFR remains, uh, it, it reduces over time. 
and only until it reaches about 25% um, GFR, so it, once it has lost 75% of function, the creatinine starts rising. Uh, so we, we will only see increasing creatinine over time once GFR has been lost. So that we don't have a good marker to follow up our patients and make surgical decisions. So pain management is critical. Adult literature supports to manage uh, with specific protocols that include uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, non-opioid medications as well, and opioid medications. But there is no good literature supporting patients. And once the blockage happens, the kidney gets distended, it hurts, but it's also most likely losing function. We have not been able to evaluate that. And there is a lot of evidence supporting the good effect of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for the management of um, the acute renal colic. So it, I think it's safe to give um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, for pain management. But unfortunately, there's no literature for pediatric patients, and we rely on what has been proven for adults. Once we are uh, evaluating how urgent should we treat our patients, I think it all comes down to deciding whether or not surgery has to be done emergently or if it can be postponed a few days later. And this is something that is very limited by technology. And I think if you have the technology, you have the availability, it's very likely that the patient will be treated on time, but I'm not sure uh, if that's possible everywhere and every time. Uh, so the creatinine levels are very dependent. I don't think we can easily make a decision to go into the operating room on a specific uh, lab result. So I want to stop here for a little bit and just say that it's really good to have a CT scan that shows the stone, but in the pediatric population, we have to be aware of the effect of radiation. And um, I, I think I would support the idea of evaluating our patients initially as the first line with ultrasonography. In good hands, it will have a sensitivity of 70%, a specificity of 95%. Not seen are not clinically significant. So even if they miss a tiny stone, it may be possible that it's not clinically significant. But that not, that's not always true. Uh, there are ways to improve that sensitivity and specificity, but there's no good data supporting whether using Doppler analysis for uh, evaluating the resistance index on the artery, um, if the twinkle artifact uh, helps, um, if um, addressing the location and size of the stone is accurate, if the presence of the ureteral jet helps or not, um, and if there is or not hydronephrosis. So overall, there's no good data supporting the images that we use. So we are left with very poor quality data that supports what we should use as the first line. But I think starting with a ultrasonography would be ideal. And here you have the uh, twinkle artifact that it's seen um, on the image on the left hand, you can see a clearly a round shape uh, structure that um, has not much shadowing. And this is something that I recently learned, to be honest, because um, you would think that a stone would always generate shadowing. And if there's no shadowing behind the stone, it, it, behind the image, then it shouldn't be a stone. With the Doppler analysis, you can clearly see the twinkle artifact, and that uh, confirms the presence of a stone. The reason for not having so much shadowing is novel ultrasound technologies allow and reduce the amount of shadowing that happens. So if you have a good ultrasound machine, you won't be seeing shadowing. And this was the stone. So you can clearly see how it, 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 it definitely shows uh, very accurately uh, the anatomy. And I think if we can reduce uh, radiation exposure, that will be critical. CT scan definitely uh, is the gold standard. 
uh, but we have to be cognizant about the principle of ALARA, which is try to reduce as much as possible the radiation that you're exposing your patients to. Increases on baseline. Um, so if you have a baseline risk for developing a future neoplasia in the general population, just with one CT scan, you're increasing that risk for developing a tumor in the future of, of about 0.3%. I think that's quite significant. If you know that this is a lifelong condition with a very likelihood of requiring fluoroscopic exposure plus CT scans in the future. Uh, single CT scans um, with no contrast give about 8.5 millisievert um, per CT scan um, and a cumulative dose of 30 millisievert uh, increases the likelihood up to 3.2 times the risk for leukemia. That's quite significant, I would say. So we have to limit what we're doing. And so the example is, if you end up uh, having uh, two CT scans that equals 17, and then if you add to that the normal baseline radiation dose that you get just because you're on earth, uh, that will put you uh, right uh, at the level of uh, a high risk for developing future issues uh, such as leukemia. In four years, you have reached already that uh, cumulative dose. So I think we have to be cognizant about that. And if you have recurrences uh, with your stones, then your numbers will go even higher. There is new evidence that low dose CT scans have uh, reduced dose exposure down to three millisievert. Uh, but of course, uh, quality of the image is reduced. There is no data supporting uh, the use of low dose CT scans in the pediatric population, but I think we're in need to explore that further. This is a graph that it's very interesting and it shows how uh, such a good job that uh, has been done here at Seattle Children's, where originally in orange, you can see that these were the percentages of CT scans that were requested in the emergency department with patients with suspected uh, kidney stones. So they showed up to the emergency department, they would have um, clinical presentation that would suggest a kidney stone, and the ER doctors would request a CT scan. And the goal was to reduce ideally below 30% that uh, amount of CT scans. And it went as high as 63%. When we uh, started and implemented this protocol where we wanted to do initially ultrasounds and depending on the result guide, the need for a CT scan, see how it dropped right away down to 14, 9%. Uh, the average right now, it's at 14%. Um, so we were able to uh, reduce the amount of CT scans from 24% uh, from to 14%. And I don't have on the graph uh, year 2021 because we have limited data due to the pandemic. But we've had a few months where we haven't done any CT scans and have been able to care for our patients. I'm sorry, this slide got duplicated. So this is a good example of uh, when the um, clinical presentation is even more important than images. This is a patient that showed up, a uh, 17-year-old male, with a history of a right-sided kidney stone that required three, uh, required th uh, treatment uh, three months prior. Uh, he did well. He had some residual stones up in the kidney, but they were fairly small and we decided to observe. He had a second episode of abdominal pain and underwent an ultrasound that showed left hydronephrosis with no visible stone. He was having intermittent episodes of pain. And at that point, we made the decision to do a CT scan, but the CT scan came back negative. So what do you do? And I think this was a very interesting learning point because we have always been told that there's no better way than a CT scan. You can see here clearly on the uh, left upper image 
the presence of uh, hydronephrosis on the kidney um, and on the coronal image on the right, you can also see that, the, that it looks uh, dilated. And the report was uh, negative. Interestingly, um, the patient persisted with pain. We thought it could have been a stricture after that initial endoscopic surgery. Um, I have been telling the residents and all the trainees that you always have to look at the images. And when we looked at the CT scan in more depth, look at what was missed. There was a very, very tiny image there that had been missed. And I think the explanation for that is if you're putting your patient into the CT scan and you're doing slices every three millimeters, like almost like the bread loaves, uh, but you have a stone right in between one slide and the other, you may be able to miss it. And that can easily happen in pediatric patients. So CT scans should either be done with finer cuts, uh, or at least you should be aware of that. And so once we have our patients ready, I think it has been very interesting to look at the literature recently and see how expulsive therapy has shown um, promising uh, results moving forward. Recently, there was some debate about whether or not it should be used, um, but more recently, there's new data supporting tamsulosin and expulsive therapy for kidney stones. It will depend on the location, size, but all this comes from adult literature. Um, and I think uh, moving forward with children, we need to get more data uh, and gather some, some additional information. Expulsive therapy uh, on three randomized controlled trials um, will increase the likelihood of stone passage almost two times. Um, so it's very important to tell families um, about this information and whether or not patients should be admit, admitted or, or discharge home, I think it will depend on multiple factors. This is a, a, a very uh, interesting uh, pediatric network where uh, Seattle Children's and many other institutions in the US are collaborating to really improve the care of our patients. And we're looking at variability in management, but also how we are providing care for our patients. So everything that I have been saying before, no good evidence in the literature, variability depending on the available technology, uh, variability on the experience of the surgeons and access to complex care teams um, is, is something that may impact the future of how we manage our patients. So this network is um, right now collecting data and uh, soon you will start hearing more about the results of this uh, research that is currently being done. So if we look at the likelihood of uh, requiring intervention in, in stone passage uh, spontaneously, you see that stones that are less than two millimeters have a mean eight days to pass uh, and the likelihood of requiring an, a surgical intervention is about 3%. The bigger the stone, the more likely it is that there will be a, a, um, there are a need for an intervention. Um, and also it depends on the location of the stone. It varies if it's proximal, mid ureter or, or low ureter. But you can see here that this is also literature from the adult world. I keep saying this on and on, but I, I wanted to really highlight it. And we cannot keep adjusting the data from adults into the pediatric population. And the reason for that is because we are not wearing, uh, kids are not wearing our shoes to go to school. So they, we shouldn't be using measurements that are, are coming from adult literature and be extrapolated to children. Is a four millimeter stone the same on an eight year old than for a 13 year old or an 18 year old? I have 18 year old patients that are way taller than me and definitely it's completely different if it's on a, on a two year old. I did yesterday a three year old girl with a six millimeter stone. Clearly it was filling the entire ureter and on adults, you probably see that at six millimeter stone, it's uh, on the low side. So I honestly believe after doing adult urology for many years and now doing pediatric urology, I 
believe that the technical aspects of doing stone, sur uh, stone surgery for uh, pediatric patients, it's way more complex than for adults. And I'll tell you a little bit about those challenges in the next few slides. So this is a one-year-old boy um, with that kidney stone. You can see that it's located at the renal pelvis. It measured two centimeters. I want you to pay, pay special attention to the um, distance between the skin and the collecting system. It was not more than 2.9 centimeters, so very shallow. Um, and for those who know how to do percutaneous nephrolithotripsies, um, they, this would be a, a fairly superficial uh, percutaneous axis. And this is where complexity becomes um, a challenge. So we have been implementing ultrasonography to get access into the collecting system. And this is something that requires technical um, expertise, but it also helps reducing that ionizing exposure to our patients. And we have been using it to locate the kidney, locate the stone and perform the puncture. This is us going, uh, preparing the case for that one-year-old boy. You can clearly see the kidney, how well we're visualizing with a probe, how we position the patient, and I'm gonna uh, let you know about positioning in a few slides. Um, and we demarked the anatomy. So see that we are doing this percutaneous nephrolithotripsy with the patient supine. So laying on his back, not uh, being prone as it has been usually done. And we demarked the uh, costal edge, uh, subcostal uh, rim, the iliac bone. And on the back, you see that flat line. Um, that's the uh, erectus muscle uh, edge. And we are hoping to get right at the petite uh, triangle. Uh, and you can see that we're lifting the patient to have access into the retroperitoneum. With the ultrasound machine, we're guiding access into the collecting system. We're hoping to get access into the lower pole for this patient. And you can see here on this image that the benefit of having this surgery done under supine is that you have access through the penis up into the kidney. So you can put contrast catheters, even you can uh, go retrograde up into the kidney if needed, but you can also have access into the uh, retroperitoneum, and you have that amplet sheath with the glide wire going into the kidney and actually coming out of the penis. So it definitely improves how we can do our procedures. For this patient, interestingly, we didn't need a nephroscope. We dilated the tract only up to 12 French, and we used the pediatric cystoscope. So this is where I uh, believe technology becomes either a benefit or a limiting factor. And if you have um, all these kind of tools, then you can definitely provide more complex care for our patients. Um, the problem is that most of the supplies that we have, like this, for example, this amplet sheath, it's designed for adult instruments and for obese patients. So it's long and we have to adjust things. So you can see that we, were, we, we had to cut the um, and trim the amplet sheath to get access into the kidney uh, with a cystoscope. We cover the patient really well with Ioban to uh, avoid the patient getting uh, cold and uh, lose uh, uh, temperature while we do the case. This is, uh, when, while I was learning the technique, this were a few things that I believe taught me a, a lot. I think positioning of the patient is critical. You see the blue pillow here. Um, if you are gonna go into the kidney and need to angle the axis, that pillow will be a problem. So you need to really make sure, um, I'm gonna go back on the slide and leave the patient right at the edge so you can angle the scope if you need to and get better access and navigate more easily. The other thing that I uh, also learned that was a good trick was how to set up the fluoroscope. 
since the patient is tilted sideways, uh, you also need to adjust the fluoroscope and uh, just turn it 50 de 15 degrees to have a more aligned access to the kidney when you're doing the puncture. The anatomical um, landmarks to get access uh, for supine surgery, once you have the patient tilted, is to align your chiva or your needle chiva uh, to the floor. So if the floor is here, you align it parallel to the floor and you aim towards the contralateral shoulder of the patient. Those two alignments plus the fluoroscopy will allow you to get right into the collecting system with no issues at all. So that's um, how um, the few tricks that I wanted to share with you for PCNLs. And this is another very interesting case, uh, very complex one. It's a girl that was born with cloacal extrophy, had a repair done. Uh, she has on the image, you can see her genitals not well reconstructed, but at least she had a continent bladder. There was a small fistula uh, and that's where she was voiding from right at the, bed, at the base of that belly button. Uh, her urethra was never reconstructed and it was completely stenosed. She only had one kidney. And unfortunately, she underwent a cystoplasty uh, with um, Ilion and uh, her bowel segment developed a stone. You can see on the right-hand image how that area uh, has collected a big uh, stone burden um, and not only that, but if we look further, there was a huge stone inside her collecting system. So how to get access if there is no access? Um, we decided to uh, combine multiple approaches and do an endoscopic versus open approach for this patient. And so how did we get up there? <coughs> it wasn't easy. And we uh, decided to... Um, use the flexible ureter scope to get into the ureter uh, by making a percutaneous entrance into the bladder. And then through that incision that we made, we advanced the ureter scope and were able to um, easily access into the stone. So I wanna leave time for discussion. Um, again, I have always had a great time um, sharing with you and would love to, to, to hear questions. I think moving forward, this is not the moon. This is actually a stone. And I think astronauts were able to get to the moon because they had the data and they had the technology. And I think if we do have both of them for our patients, we'll be able to remove this massive stones better. You can see that it was probably the size of an orange or even bigger and it was filling up the bladder of a, of a pediatric patient. So um, I think the efforts moving forward will have to be in the direction of improving the quality of the research that we're doing and also increasing uh, the knowledge about uh, novel technologies that can be adjusted for pediatric patients. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fernandez. Do we have any questions? Yeah, I'm just asking from the Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Mungun Totlak. I'm from Children's Hospital, uh, pediatric urologist. Uh, I have one question uh, about the position of the patient. It uh, depends on age or 
अच्छा हम्म अब चीज़ है यूनी कौन तो शायद सुन कौन कौन तो about the position of the patient uh, when we're doing the PCNL? Yes, so th that's a very good question. Um, when I did when I did my training in adult urology, I I actually um, learned to do the PCNLs with patients in prone positions. So flipped upside down. And we thought that that was technically easy because we were just entering right behind the kidney and there were no other structures uh, present there. And once I learned the supine position, um, I think I've been able to do more complex cases because I have been able to introduce from the penis up a uh, flexible ureteroscope and through the PCNL take care of um, uh, both um, accesses at the same time. So right now, I guess, um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I, I've been doing supine PCNLs for every patient. Um, I think it has benefit uh, how we can treat our, our, our patients and it applies for adult patients as well. I haven't seen any true contraindications. I think the limiting factor is learning how to do it. Uh, and, and, and the position of supine, um, once I have uh, told the trainees how to do it, I think they have said that they feel more comfortable doing it supine than prone. So I think the learning curve may be shorter. Okay, thank you for the uh, joint answer. The, the other benefit about supine uh, positions is that the anesthesiologist don't have to worry about ventilation issues during surgery. Um, and uh, also the need for starting the case supine and turning the patient once asleep uh, to the prone position, which is also sometimes um, cumbersome. Yeah, Okay, Dr. Fernandez, I have a question about the post operation dietary for the no recurrence for the children's patients. What kind of the dietary advice you give them? That's a very good question. And we do have here a combined clinic. So every patient that has a stone in our institution, what we do is we do a multidisciplinary clinic uh, with the nephrologist, with the dietitian, and with a urologist. And we're all together at the same time. And we all give our input. For the general population, um, I think um, basically the, the, the only two things that have proven to reduce the recurrence of kidney stones is increasing the fluid intake with water and reducing the salt intake. So sodium intake should be reduced. Um, every patient that has a stone, uh, we do a comprehensive metabolic analysis and we do analyze 24 hour urine collections. We evaluate the um, electrolytes and uh, how those electrolytes are lost in the urine. And if we identify a metabolic, specific metabolic uh, condition that we can treat, we then tailor the diet and the treatment based on that specific metabolic panel. Uh, but that is not a usual and common, common finding, similar to uh, when we can analyze the composition of the stones. Since most of them are calcium oxalate, um, we tend to reduce the amount of oxalate in the diet and keep normal dairy products. Um, so that, those are the general recommendations. Thank you.
thank you. And also, there's another question uh, uh, about. No, oh, I forgot. Uh, there's a. Ah, do you use uh, the uh, potassium citrates for the children? We do. Yes, we do for patients. Uh, that also depends on the levels of citrate. So we measure those um, and also the composition of the stone. Um, we tend to like, uh, regardless of the composition of the stone, uh, we'd like to keep a neutral pH. So we also tend to adjust our management uh, based on that as well. And keep it as neutral as possible or more acidic, yeah. Mostly, how long do you use for the potassium citroid? Uh, for example, there is like an, the very tiny stone in the kidney, and but a patient does not have any of the symptoms and complainings. Can you, are we gonna use uh, the only potassium citroid? Uh, yes, but we, we use it and we keep using it depending on uh, the levels. So we monitor citrate levels and if we believe that the patient will benefit from continuing citrate, uh, we continue it regardless of the presence and size of the stone. So if they have hypocitraturia, uh, then we tend to increase it and we monitor citrate levels. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's great. We are happy to have a new. And so, my name is Zohar. So, 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 I know. Hindi, then, Chhodoni, Zubdoni, then, then, my name is Nitya. So, I talk some Bhakti. Oh, it's clear. Why are you there? Archudar, I'm going to go. No, no. In the one that you talk on Hukting, that you share the worst in Chhodota, take it to Bhakti, then, Dorangari, I, I'm a management lady, so that. Ah, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to is located in a urethral vesicle junction and uh, how are, are you gonna to operate this kind of thing? Is that, is that the form of the open surgery for the children? I, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question because I couldn't hear you well. What's the management for uh, the urethral vesicle junction stone in the <laughs> uh, The one who has uh, uh, the urethral vesicle junction stone Perform with the open surgery. How are you going to manage the urethral junction stone in pediatric case? Okay, so distal stones. Um, I've it's interesting because I've seen patients that have passed huge stones. No, I don't know why. Um, and other patients that cannot pass them. And I think ultimately. Um, the limiting factor, as I mentioned, is technology. If you have the possibility of having a small endoscope, um, I would probably recommend doing um, as much as you can endoscopically. Avoid any open surgery or laparoscopic surgery. So for distal UVJ stones, I, I found that if you can start the patient up front with tamsulosin, it increases the likelihood of going into the ureter successfully. Um, and just with a couple of days, you can uh, get better access. Again, there is no data supporting that in, in pediatric patients, but I, I, as far as I can remember, I haven't had a case where uh, probably one in the last year where I haven't been able to get into the ureter. And Again, I've been doing three-year-old patients, one-year-old patients. So having that, I think it helps. If you do have a six French cystoscope, you can easily get access into the ureter for those patients. And the, the few tricks where I have been um, successful at 
are if you go in with a cystoscope and stand right at the orifice at the uo you advance a wire and then you know that the wire comes out from the lower part of the cystoscope if you flip this the cystoscope upside down and the wire comes on top it will actually the wire will be coming into the orifice and it will be lifting it and it opens up the entrance and then you can go in with the scope i think that's a very cool trick um let me see if i have uh pictures i may not have them easily but uh, maybe i can promise you to uh get uh hopefully a video for our next talk and i'll start with that uh the next time we meet but it's just lifting so almost like a tent you go in and lift the ureter with the glide wire and that helps you enter with the scope into the uo once you're in there um fragmentation i think it's ideally done with the holmium laser uh or tulium if you have it available but um i i wouldn't go in and try to take it out with a grasper or a basket i think it's better if you can do it just with uh vaporizing or i'm sorry fragmenting the the stone the less you go in and out the better so try to be as efficient as possible once you are into the spot where the stone is don't come out and leave a wire or or try to go in and out because you will start increasing the edema and that is very different from adults on adult patients you can go in and out as many times as you want but on pediatric patients the less the better Uh, Яаж нөгөө нэг шийдвэрлэг байгаа аксес болох уу гэдэг талаар нэлээд сайн тайлбаруудыг хийж авах шиг байна. А тэгээд тий. За. Өөр асуулттай хүн байна уу? За за баярлалаа гэдэг юм. Тэгээд тасан. Окей, we don't have any further questions and Dr. Hur thank you for the hosting this uh, uh, meeting i'm i'm the one who's thankful i always enjoy sharing with you um it would be great if you can teach me any tricks that you know um i'm i'm sure you you will have more than i do the tanar ч гэсэн надад ч гэсэн хуваалцахаар янз бүрийн тийм арга барил юм байв над ч гэсэн хуваалцахад би таа таа байх болно шүү гэж юм манаха тийм юм байна уу Okay uh, we don't have any for the question shall we end this meeting for today Thank you so much Dr. Fernandez and thank you to everyone else who attended Yeah thank you all and hope to see you next month Okay see you next Stay month Stay safe